Uh, let me also thank the organizers for bravely bringing us together for this nice conference. And thank to Gabriel for introducing one of these CFTs for me. Uh, I will discuss some work that I have done with Carlo Menegelli recently um, in this paper from March and in another paper that will hopefully appear uh, before the end of the year. So um, I will start by giving a brief overview of the setup that was also discussed by uh, Andrea on Tuesday. The idea is to consider a special supersymmetric Wilson line in uh, n equals four superior mills, uh, where we couple uh, the gauge field along the Euclidean time direction, uh, but also we couple um, one of the six fundamental scalars of n equals four. Um, and also, sorry, we are working in the planar limit, so uh, SUN gauge group with infinite n. This is also known as the Wilson Maldacena line. It is um, in the when it is straight or circular. It preserves, it preserves half of the supersymmetries of n equals four, and in particular, a, a super conformal algebra, which is OSP four slash four. To see uh, what, does, what this means in practice, we can consider uh, the bosonic part of the super algebra of n equals four, which is PSU two comma two slash four, uh, and compare it with the bosonic uh, part of OSP four slash four. And we can see um, that the presence of a line breaks the conformal algebra SO4, 2 into two components, an SO1, 2, which plays the role of uh, a conformal algebra in one dimension, and an SO3, which corresponds to transverse rotations around the line. Uh, but also, we are coupling one of the scalars uh, of the six scalars of n equals 4 to the line, and this breaks the SO6 R symmetry to an SO5, which is uh, an R symmetry from the point of view of this 1D CFT. Apart from the uh, line itself, one can, can of course compute the expectation value, but we can do more. And in particular, we can consider this kind of uh, double angle correlators, which are just uh, usual correlators where we insert uh, a joint operators of n equals four uh, along the Wilson line. And then we, we, we take the trace over these and we compute the expectation value. And because of um, this conformal algebra that's, that is preserved in one dimension, uh, these uh, observables, besides being gauge invariant, also satisfy the axioms of a 1D CFT. And so they provide an interesting model in one dimension. A uh, model that is not only interesting by itself, uh, but also uh, because if you want to compute the expectation value of Wilson loops of arbitrary shape, you can just in insert uh, appropriately local operators along the line uh, of the straight half PPS loop, and then you can compute uh, uh, expectation values of loops of arbitrary shape. Um, and let me also make another comment about this 1D theory, which is that uh, we are in the planar limit, uh, but n equals four admits a marginal deformation or a marginal coupling. Uh, we take this to be the tooth coupling lambda. And so we have a 1D theory uh, with uh, this marginal parameter. And uh, it will be uh, interesting to consider analytically both uh, the weak coupling and the strong coupling regime. We will focus mostly on the strong coupling, but I will also discuss uh, some results of weak coupling. The um, point of view that I will adopt during this talk is that of the analytic bootstrap, uh, where uh, symmetries are, are, of course, very important because it is uh, what we use to constrain the observables. And so uh, the first thing that one has to study in this setup is the super multiplets or representation theory of OSP4/4. Um, among the various operators that one can have, we are interested mainly in two types of multiplets. First of all, long multiplets uh, with conformal, conformal dimension delta that is unprotected. Uh, it only has to satisfy some unitarity bounds. Um, we will take the um, SO3 spin to be zero uh, in all of the, for the rest of this talk. Uh, and in principle, we can have arbitrary uh, SO5 representation with thinking labels A, A and B, where the notation is explained here. Um, and the other type of multiplets that will be relevant is uh, one half PPS multiplets um, that can be obtained um, essentially taking uh, the, product, the product of K of the um, K copies of the five scalars that are not coupled to the line. And then we combine the indices in a symmetric traceless uh, combination. The uh, super primaries of these multiplets have protected dimension K, uh, zero transverse spin, and they are, uh, of course, in the symmetric traces uh, representation uh, of SO5. Uh, so there is an infinite families of this for every inter integer value of K. Uh, but one example is more important than the others, and it is the displacement multiplet. It is the simplest one 
the super primary has conformal dimension one, uh, and it consists essentially of the five scalars not coupled to the line. Then we have a fermion, well, eight fermions of dimension three halves. And finally, an operator of dimension two, uh, which is called uh, the displacement operator. And it is um, an operator that is present in any defect theory because it descends from the stress tensor of the parent higher dimensional theory. Um, as I said, we have um, a coupling constant that we can tune. Um, and let me first mention what happens uh, at weak coupling, where one can compute correlators and observables using Feynman diagrams or more sophisticated techniques such as supersymmetric localization or integrability. And there's a lot of papers about this. I will not cite any of them. Sorry for this. Um, I will instead focus on uh, the two observables that I will discuss mostly during the talk. The first is the four-point function of four half VPS operators. And this was computed to the first non-trivial order uh, in this paper by Kiri and Komatsu, um, so order lambda. Um, and the other observable that I will discuss is the uh, conformal dimension of the lowest non-protected state in the theory, uh, which at weak coupling corresponds to uh, the scalar, uh, of the fundamental scalar of n equals four that is coupled to the line. This is of course dimension one uh, in the free theory, um, and then uh, various corrections were computed uh, during the, the past years. The first one, uh, the order lambda correction was already computed in this paper by uh, Aldai and Maldacena. And uh, in that paper, they, they expected this operator to become uh, infinitely uh, um, heavy uh, at large lambda. Uh, but then uh, I will show you later, and also Andrea showed you that uh, this turned out actually to be false. And then uh, now we know uh, up to order lambda to the five, the dimension of this operator after this paper um, last year by Grabner, Grobom and Julius that computed this dimension using the quantum spectral curve. So we see here already that there is a link to integrability. Um, and actually uh, now uh, from Andrea's talk and this recent paper, uh, we know uh, a lot about the spectrum uh, and the OP coefficients in this theory. On the other hand, we can also study the theory at strong coupling, which is something that was discussed first in this paper by John B. Royban and Cyclin, and was also discussed by, by Gabriel in, in the last talk, um, using the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, we have planar n equals four super young meals that we all know is dual to type two B string theory on ADS-5 cross S5. And when we take a, a straight half VPS line in, in n equals four, this is dual to uh, a super string with uh, ADS2 world sheet. Um, what we are doing in the CFT is perturbing this uh, configuration by the insertion of local operators. And in particular, the most important operator, this phi, these five uh, scalars not coupled to the line are dual to uh, excitations of the string um, along the S5 directions. Uh, while for instance, the displacement operator, uh, this F of dimension two is dual to uh, ADS5 fluctuations transverse to the ADS2. So that's why we only have three uh, of these scalars. Um, and to compute observables here, uh, one can use uh, in principle Witten diagrams, uh, which is the analog of Feynman diagrams. Um, and this was used to compute the simplest of uh, the correlators between half VPS operators at three level or order one of root lambda. Uh, but uh, more effectively, more efficiently, uh, one can actually use bootstrap which was done for the first time in this paper by Pedro Liendo, Carlo Menegelli, and Vladimir Mitev, um, where the same observable will compu was computed to order one over lambda. Um, as for, uh, well, both points of view were adopted for ABJM, as we learned from, from Gabriel. And the uh, other observable that uh, we're interested in is this dimension of uh, the scalar phi six. Uh, that, as I mentioned, was expected to decouple at strong coupling, uh, it actually does not decouple. Rather, um, it can be described that infinite strong coupling by um, the uh, singlet combination of two uh, of these fundamental scalars. Uh, it, it, we, we call it essentially phi squared, like roughly. And since it's built out of two operators of dimension one, at strong coupling, its dimension is two. And then uh, in the paper by John B. Robin and Cycling, the first correction was computed. And then the second by uh, Pedro, Carlo, and Vladimir. And then uh, again in this paper by uh, Grabnev, Gromov, and Julius, we have uh, more corrections with some uh, numerical data. Um, and so we know more about these operators, this operator. 
um, in this context, uh, we then present uh, our recent results. Uh, what we consider is the half PPS line at strong coupling, not at weak coupling, uh, using uh, 1D analytic bootstrap techniques that were introduced in these two papers. And what we were able to compute so far is um, correlators uh, of pairwise equal uh, half PPS operators at order one over lambda or one loop, uh, as well as, and most importantly, maybe uh, the correlators, uh, the correlator between the displacement for displacement operators uh, at three loops or order one over lambda squared, uh, which, as I said, is three loops in Vitten diagrams. And I think this is the first result of this kind that we have, although in this simpler setup that is uh, one dimensional CFTs. And we, we also computed um, analytically the first four corrections to the dimension of this operator phi squared, as well as uh, the correction to uh, its OP coefficient between uh, phi squared and uh, two fields phi. Um, so this is just an overview of the results, uh, which hides a lot of our computations, of course. And among the various problems that we had to face, I want to uh, mention one in particular, uh, which is the mixing problem. Here I borrowed or stole, according to your point of view, uh, a picture uh, from Andrea's talk. Um, and uh, you can see here uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the toothed coupling lambda. So you should imagine to extend these lines until they reach an asymptote. And we can see that when the strongly coupled dimension is two, we only have one state, which at weak coupling is phi six of dimension one. Uh, but already at delta equals four, which is the next level, um, we have two states. So these two states have the same dimension, uh, which is for a strong coupling. And, and then we have uh, four states with dimension six and so on. And this uh, number of states, which are degenerate, keeps increasing. And this um, is a very complicated problem, although very common from the point of view of bootstrap. Um, what we do in the paper is uh, partially, and in a specific sense, resolve this bootstrap and to uh, this mixing, sorry. Uh, and to understand it better, let me give a very simple example of uh, how this works. Um, so if we focus on the sector of states with dimension four, uh, using the field phi, we can build two operators, one with four phi's and one with two phi's and two derivatives. And you can immediately see that the strong coupling that will have the, the same dimension. This is very common in perturbative CFTs. Um, and we do to resolve it. And the uh, typical way in which this is done is by considering not just one correlator, although we want to compute one, 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 one eventually, uh, we need to, to consider a whole family of correlators. And the uh, big problem of this setup is that as opposed to uh, other cases in which mixing has been solved, the number of degenerate states uh, grows with delta, uh, with the power of delta, which is not one, uh, as in other cases such as holographic for the n equals four superior meals or 62,0, but rather with delta squared. And so we had to resort to different techniques. In particular, in this holographic context that I mentioned, uh, what people usually do is consider uh, correlators between pairwise equal half PPS operators. But this turns out to be not enough in our case. So we had to do something more uh, and also rather new from the point of view of analytic bootstrap, which is to consider this other family of correlators where we have three protected operators and one uh, non-protected operator. Um, and this is uh, just the simplest, simplest example in this delta equals four sector. Uh, this is the dilatation operator restricted to the sector. It is a two by two matrix because we have two states. They start with the same dimension four. Uh, interestingly, and we will see that there is a reason for this, they still have the same dimension at three level. And then at one loop, uh, we see a, a very non-trivial mixing matrix. And this is uh, where the problem actually lies. Uh, so yes, please. Sorry? Do you use more bootstrap protected operators? Uh, no, no. The, the problem is, is, is about uh, how many states you generate in the OPE between two protected ones. And they, uh, so you, you see that the generacy grows with delta squared. But uh, if you take two protected ones, they only pick one direction in that huge space of states. Even so that's, if you use different P1, P2, it's not enough. But it doesn't work. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We, we tried with that, and we, we got stuck for a very long time, actually. And then we, we found this solution of including a long one. Um, so after this presentation, brief presentation, let me also give a motivation why we're interested in this setup. 
first of all, it is an interesting arena to study and develop 1D CFT techniques. Uh, we learned about Melin space from Gabriel. Uh, the technique that we use here is based on uh, making an ansatz with some fixed transcendentality. We'll discuss this later. Uh, but another interesting um, and promising approach is based on the uh, 1D inversion formula. Another motivation uh, is precisely related to this mixing problem, which is uh, more complicated than the one uh, encountered in n equals 4 supering meals or 60 n equals 2,0 at large n. Um, in particular, um, as I said, we had to consider a different class of operators, uh, but we don't expect this to be uh, only a feature of our case, but rather we expect that also in a higher dimensional CFTs, if you go to subleading orders in one over n, you encounter a bigger degeneracy. And so uh, it might be the case that you also have to consider uh, non-protected operators to resolve the mixing. Uh, and finally, and probably most importantly for this conference, uh, as we learned from Andrea, there is a nice interplay between integrability and bootstrap. Um, and there is this very interesting question of whether combining uh, the two approaches, we can actually solve this one-dimensional CFT. So before I go on with the rest of the talk, is there any question? Okay. So um, I will now fill in some technical details that I omitted in this uh, short presentation. Uh, I will first discuss the spectrum of the theory at strong coupling, um, the super conformal kinematics of the correlators that we bootstrap, and then the actual th technique that we use to, to bootstrap them. Um, to conclude uh, with more comments on the mixing problem, and finally, uh, some results uh, and outlook. Let's start with the study of the spectrum and strong coupling. So, um, as I said, the strong coupling, we have to rely on the ADS description, uh, where um, the, the correlation functions along the line uh, are given by fluctuations of this super string, uh, parameterized therefore by its coordinates. Uh, and they are dual to uh, the displacement multiplet, where we have uh, these five phi's and then some fermions and then this displacement operator. And all the states um, in the theory can be built out of products uh, of the states given by the superstring coordinates. So we will write the Hilbert space um, as a direct sum of Hilbert spaces of states with fixed length. And by length, uh, I mean how many times we use uh, these three fundamental objects. So an operator like phi to the four uh, will have length four because we used phi four times. Um, each uh, subspace at fixed length um, is uh, a graded symmetrized product of these human multiplets, uh, graded because we take sy symmetry for bosons and anti-symmetry for fermions, of course. Um, and an important aspect is that uh, we can, of course, use OSP representation theory to uh, decompose each space into a, a sum of an irreducible representation of our superconformal algebra. Uh, but uh, because of this mixing, there will be more than one state for every fixed representation. So if you fix, for instance, a representation with delta equals four and the singlet of SO3 and SO5, as I showed you earlier, you have two states. And so we have these degeneracy spaces uh, that we have to take into account. Uh, an explicit example is for length two, uh, where H2 contains the multiple D2, which is just a symmetric traceless combination of two phi's. And then we have long operators, which are singlet of their symmetries uh, with even delta. And interestingly, this uh, space is multiplicity free. So at length two, we have one state um, for every delta. Uh, whereas for length four, we have a very similar structure where here we have uh, other representation of their symmetry. Uh, but the important aspect is that uh, even just for the singlet, uh, if you fix a value of delta, you will not have only one state, but rather many states, and their number grows, as I anticipated, with uh, delta squared. Um, let's, so this was the free theory, well, the theory that we have an infinite, at infinitely strong coupling. Let's see what happens when we add perturbations. Uh, from the point of view of AD ADS2, one can just take the action of the superstring um, and expand it around ADS2. And here I am showing schematically just a few terms, only focusing on uh, the five scalars phi. Uh, they have, of course, a kinetic term. And then there is a structure where the uh, order one over root lambda, the first order, comes with a phi to the four interaction with derivatives. Then order one over lambda will be phi to the six with derivatives. And then uh, 
you have phi to the eight with one over lambda to the three halves and so on. The important point is that um, if you focus on the on three level, there is only one vertex and this will play an important role. Um, so from this structure and from bootstrapping uh, correlators of half PPS operators to three level and one loop, what we argue is that the dilatation operator at three levels, so the first correction, can only connect um, the generacy spaces with fixed length. Um, so I, I will show you uh, this in, in more detail in the next slide, uh, but the first order dilatation operator cannot change the length of the states. Uh, whereas the second order operator can change the length of the states uh, at most by two units, either by zero or by two units. Uh, to, to explain this and actually understand it better, let me give an example for delta equals six, uh, where we have four states, one with uh, length two, two with length four, and one with length six. Uh, and this is the, uh, you have, instead of having just one anomalous dimension for each of these, you have to consider the whole subspace and you have an anomalous dimension matrix. And these can be uh, divided in various, uh, in various blocks this will be the block that connects length two with length two and then two to four and so on. Um, if we focus on three levels, so the first order correction, uh, what I argued is that we can only, we cannot change the length by four. So these two blocks will be excluded and we cannot change the length by two. So these two blocks will be also excluded. So the structure is this, it is block diagonal, but carefully it is not necessarily diagonal. In particular, because we have two states of length four uh, this block here is not a scalar, but a two by two matrix that can in principle be of diagonal. Uh, whereas if we move to uh, one loop, so the second order correction, uh, the only thing that is forbidden for this uh, delta equals six case is changing the length by four. Um, so the, the allowed structure is the one that you can see. Um, and what we will find, and I will justify this later, is that we, we do not need to find the whole matrix for our purposes, we will only need uh, these two blocks, but this is an aspect that I will clarify later. Um, so this is the general structure allowed essentially by the ADS Lagrangian, but in practice and more explicitly, what we find is um, a bit simpler, especially for, th for three level, uh, because this is the structure of the uh, three level anomalous dimension matrix. And you can see it is proportional to the identity. Uh, whereas at one loop, uh, the structure is way more complicated. Uh, but the fact that at three level, this is proportional to the identity, um, and it was the same for delta equals four, again, is not a coincidence, but rather a consequence of the fact that the dilatation operator uh, at three level or the first order correction is proportional to the Casimir operator of OSP four slash four. In particular, the uh, anomalous dimension matrix will be uh, minus one half times the Casimir operator, which is given here in terms of the dimension delta, the SO3 spin S, and the Dinkin labels A and B for uh, SO5. Um, so uh, the consequence of this, that uh, when well, there is a proof of this, but I don't want to go too much into the details. The consequence of this is that the uh, first order correction to the dimension of every state does not depend on the details of how the state is built, uh, but only on its uh, representation. And so the degeneracy that was present in the free theory is uh, not broken, it is not lifted at three level. If two states had the same dimension in the free theory, they keep having the same dimension uh, at three level. Uh, and only at second order, uh, this um, degeneracy breaks, and we actually have a non trivial mixing problem uh, that we have to address. Um, so let, let's then move to the actual more uh, bootstrap part. For those of you that are not familiar or interested in bootstrap, I'll, I'll try and make it uh, quick. Is there a question? So the, the structure that you that you showed us with uh, the matrix, uh, well, the dimension six, yes. So here, this, uh, this red cross is there just for one loop. So would you expect that at two loops, these things will yes. grow higher yes, and higher? Exactly. So we don't change the length at three level. We change it by two units at one loop, then at by four at two loops. OK, so on. this is going to grow. Yeah, and it is related to the structure of the vertices. The first order correction, there is only a quartic vertex. Then you have a six point vertex at one loop, eight points, and so on. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I have a very basic question. It's probably my confusion, but if you look at the four point function, um, uh, not on the defect, just of single trace operators, 
and then you think about the conformal block, the operator that pass in the conformal block decomposition, there's single trace and double trace, and it's crucial to understand both. Here, you don't have any analog of this, of this distinguish between single trace and double trace? No. But all operators appear in the same footing. Yeah, exactly, because we're taking infinite n from the start. So you take a semi-classical string from the ADS point of view, and there is no n, so there is no notion of single, double, or triple trace. And all the operators are on the same footing. Um, so that's why it's a bit well, different it, from the I, usual set of Even in the planar setup. limit, if you want to do planar limit four point function of single trace operator, uh, you still have to deal with both single and double trace. So I guess it's maybe it's because it's open string or something. But yes, it is an open string, but. Um, Okay, you there is, there is no. Question. I think the point is that there are no one over n corrections here. It's really infinite n. I don't know if this really answers the question. Probably I think not. that doesn't because it's the same problem in the other observable. But uh, thank you. We'll, I Sorry, will, I, will I, I, I don't have a better answer. Uh, I think like, that the most practical answer is just that there is no distinction between single and double trace. Well, actually, uh, sorry, the point is that you're taking the trace inside the definition of correlators. So they're not n by n matrices, these operators. They, they, you should really think of them as scalars. So, yeah. OK. So uh, just, yeah, probably Carlo, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oops. Sorry if I interrupt. But uh, as you were saying, so essentially, what in ADS you would th th um, consider uh, multi-particle state in ADS are actually uh, uh, all coming in the gauge theory side, as uh, Andrea explained. But you per, as the first plot, one of the first few plots that uh, Pietro showed from Andrea, they all come from open traces operators inserted uh, in the Wilson line, which are the analog of uh, single trace. So there is no single trace in multi-trace, as Pietro say, but the, what you would call single trace. Uh, at uh, weak coupling are uh, correspond to multi-particle state in ADS. And what is exchanged in the OP are only those. Maybe that's, I mean, what is exchanged in the OP when n is infinity are only those operators. There is no issue with analog of multi-trace. I don't know if it explains anything. Thank you, Carlo. Okay. Um, so uh, as I was saying briefly, some kinematics for, for the cor two correlators we're interested in. Um, the first type is half PPS correlators, or correlators of half PPS operators. And for these, uh, a very nice analytic superspace formalism was built in this paper uh, by Pedro, Carlo, and Vladimir. Um, and okay. Uh, so what one does, uh, as usual in this kind of setups, is contracting the um, R symmetry indices with some null polarizations because we're talking about symmetric traceless representations. And then you have the operators that depend on position space and our symmetry space variables. And the correlator as usual will be built out of a prefactor completely dictated by kinematics and then a dynamical function which depends on a position space cross ratio chi and two uh, our symmetry cross ratios zeta one and zeta two. Um, and the interesting fact is that supersymmetry uh, implies that all the correlators between descendants of these superprimaries are fixed in terms of the correlator between the superprimaries. So we don't need to worry about the super descendants. Uh, but also, uh, it um, forces the, uh, this function G to satisfy an additional constraint known as worded entity, um, which you can see here. Um, so I will not discuss many details uh, about this superspace and, and the correlators. Let me just mention that uh, we know uh, all the relevant superconformal blocks for this type of correlators. Uh, and so we will, every expansion in blocks that we do is in super blocks. And as Gabriel also said, uh, we are partially solving the mixing by using super blocks instead of ordinary blocks. Um, in the special case of the 1111 correlator, which is the simplest, uh, we can solve uh, in general these word entities in terms of two quantities. One is a number, the script F. Uh, which is fully known from localization at every order in lambda, from this nice paper by Jombi and Komatsu. And this is related uh, to the existence of a topological sector uh, or a protected sector between half PPS operators, 
as you can see from here, uh, in the OP one times one, we have a protected operator, which is D2, um, and we know everything about that OP, and so uh, we know these uh, numbers crypt at, at all orders. And the other ingredient is uh, a, dynamic, a dynamical function, uh, which is what we bootstrap, and notice that it only depends on chi and not on the two other cross ratios, zeta one and zeta two. Um, and it satisfies a very simple crossing equation. The other type of correlators that we are, as I said, forced to consider to solve the mixing uh, are correlators with, uh, with um, a long operator as well. Um, and uh, these are also fixed uh, uniquely in terms of a single function of chi. Again, this is, uh, there is some kinematics and then there is this dynamical function, which is what we bootstrap. Um, and the reason why these correlators are interesting is that uh, the OPE between uh, these two guys here contains exactly uh, the same operators that appear in the uh, D1, D1 OPE. Uh, and we will be interested in solving the mixing for these operators, so it's good that they appear in both OPEs. Um, so this was essentially all kinematics. Let's move to the dynamics and see how we compute the, the correlators uh, with a special bootstrap technique in one dimension. Uh, the idea that first appeared in some unpublished notes by Fernando and then was developed um, by, in this paper by Pedro, Vladimir, and, and Carlo, uh, and also at one loop later in this paper uh, by myself and other collaborators. Um, the idea is that when the correlators um, are analytic functions of the cross ratio chi, uh, where chi can uh, range in the whole complex plane, and the only non-analyticities come from poles or branch cuts, um, branch points located at zero, one, at infinity, which are the three OP leads. So one is led to consider an ansatz of this kind, uh, where I will, I will now unpack the various ingredients. Uh, in particular, I will denote by L uh, the perturbative order that we're interested in, where L equals one will be three level and, and so on. Um, this PI of chi are unknown polynomials, which is uh, what we, we will try and fix. Uh, whereas these TI are transcendental functions in specifically multiple polylogarithms, and I will say later uh, which type of polylogs we have to, to take into account. Uh, whereas N of L is the dimension of the basis of polylogs that we use at each order. I will be more clear about these polylogs. And notice that, um, so these are polynomials, they bring no poles or anything. The uh, branch cuts will come from the transcendental functions uh, and the denominators encode um, poles located at zero and one. Um, and the strategy that we will adopt is that of fixing a basis of polylogs. So you tell me uh, you're interested in a one loop correlator. I tell you which polylogs you have to use. And the only unknown is then the polynomials. And the idea is use constraints to fix the polynomials. Uh, so a few words about uh, these polylogs. So this is just a definition of multiple polylogarithms as iterated integrals. Uh, they depend on one variable, uh, chi, and uh, on uh, t parameters where uh, this T is what I will call transcendentality or weight. Um, so there is a, this is a huge class of polynomials because you can take this AI to be any real number in principle. Uh, but since we only want branch points at chi equals zero, one or infinity, we are forced to take uh, these AIs to be only zero or one. And uh, in particular for our purposes, uh, all we will need is uh, logs and ordinary polylogs. So I introduced this fancy notation just to say that AI can be only zero or one. Uh, you can forget that and focus on uh, the logs and polylogs that you're probably familiar with. Um, and note that uh, for fixed T, for fixed transcendentality, there are only two, well only, there are two to the T independent functions. Um, so what you need to specify to, to fix the answers, you have this basis of function, which is still infinite. Uh, you have to specify what is the maximal transcendentality of these polylogs that you will use. And for reasons that I don't have time to, to explain, but there is a, a very good motivation, at each order L, uh, the right basis for this uh, Wilson line in A equals four, uh, the correlators have maximal transcendentality equal to L. Um, this is the simplest example, the three level correction, just to unpack all that I said in the last three slides. Maximal transcendentality one means that we can only include the function one, which is here, and then log chi and log one minus chi. For uh, L equals two, so one loop, we have more functions. We have uh, the same three that we use at three level. And then we have four functions of transcendentality two. So log squared of chi, log chi, log one minus chi, log squared of one minus chi, and lead two of chi. And if you move on to the next perturbative orders, 
the structure remains the same, you just have to add more functions. Um, and the polynomials are, of course, the unknown, and they, this is what I will now explain how to fix. Uh, we will fix them using some constraints. Uh, the first, and probably the most important, uh, is an analysis of the powers of log of chi that appear in the, in the OP. Uh, then we have crossing symmetry, uh, braiding symmetry um, that are uh, somehow related, um, the presence of a topological sector, and the behavior of the CFD data uh, at large delta. Uh, I will only discuss in detail because uh, I was just told that I only have 10 minutes, um, the powers of log. Uh, the idea is that uh, we can expand these correlators in conformal blocks, uh, non-perturbatively in principle. But then what we're doing um, is a perturbative expansion of our correlator of the uh, dimensions and the OP coefficients. And the conformal blocks have a very special structure, uh, which is uh, if expanded at chi equals zero, they contain a power of chi, which is the dimension of the uh, operator, uh, times an analytic function uh, at, at chi equals zero. And if we put all of these ingredients together, when you expand this power of chi, you will find some logs. And so at each order L, uh, the correlator can be written as a sum of powers of log uh, with coefficients that are analytic functions at chi equals zero. And the uh, most important ingredient of our bootstrap setup uh, is that at each order, um, these functions gl log k uh, can be computed from CFD data at previous orders for all k greater or equal than two. Uh, again, to unpack a little bit, um, let me give you a couple of examples. If you are at one loop, so perturbative order two, lo the log squared contribution to the correlator is given by a sum where here we have free theory CFD data and first order anomalous dimensions. So if you already solved the problem in the previous order, you already know this. And similarly, for uh, other cases, these are just some examples. So uh, then we have crossing that just relates uh, these three configurations. So you will, you will have functional relations uh, between your polynomials, such as the one that you can see on the bottom. Um, we have a topological sector, which is the OP coefficients between these short operators. And these um, are known from localization, so they, they put some further constraints. And then we have some restriction uh, that we impose based on effective field theory considerations on the behavior of these um, CFT data, or in particular the anomalous dimensions uh, for large delta. But sorry, I don't have time, so I will skip these uh, details. Uh, the important point is that in principle, what I described or I was supposed to describe um, in, the, in the last section uh, is enough to bootstrap these correlators at every order. But in practice, uh, we didn't take into account uh, the degeneracy of operators. And this is what I will do now. And it, it is probably conceptually the most complicated part uh, of this uh, project. So the idea is that uh, for every fixed conformal dimension and representation of their symmetry, there is more than one operator in general. And so when in the OPE, you write something like this that you might have seen in some CFD papers, uh, where you sum over uh, CFT data and conform blocks, this is actually wrong in this setup. And you should replace this with an average over uh, the degeneracy spaces. Uh, and more precisely, you should write expressions like this, uh, where we have uh, this A and B that run over the, degeneracy, the space of degenerate operators. And you have to consider all the OP coefficients with all these operators with the same dimension and a full matrix rather than just a number for the anomalous dimension. And the issue with this is that uh, in reconstructing our correlator per correlators perturbatively, we need stuff like products of CFT data, such as gamma one squared. But since you have an average, if you only know the average of gamma one and you square it, this will be different from the average of gamma one squared. And so you run into problems and you have to consider a family of correlators. Actually, three level is safe because as I told you, the uh, Anomalous dimensions at this, at this order are proportional to the Casimir, so proportional to the identity, and therefore this uh, equality is actually fine. So the, the problem is moved to a subsequent order, and in particular, the first time we have an unknown combination of CFT data is at three loops, where we really need to compute the average of gamma two squared, which is different from uh, average of gamma two and then the square. Uh, again, more precisely, we have this, uh, uh, fancy combination of objects. You have two times the OP coefficients and then two times the anomalous dimension matrix. And so in principle, you need to know all the entries of this anomalous dimension matrix and 
here is uh, like there's many of them, they increase in number, increase in delta. So it's, it's actually very complicated, uh, but there is a simplification. And the simplification is that we are considering the one, one, one correlator and the OP coefficient between two D1 and another operator is only non-zero for states of length two. And those are non-degenerate. So putting this together in our huge sum, um, we can drop the sum over A and C and replace them with just the operator of length two. And then we only have a sum over B, um, which is one of the indices of these matrices. Uh, and this uh, receives contribution from states with length two and states with length four. So not only uh, uh, we only have one sum, uh, but also we only need to focus on states of length two and four. Um, this is known from D111 at one loop and the complication was to compute this object or in other words, to compute uh, these entries of the anomalous dimension matrix. Um, and this is why uh, we considered these other family of correlators, one, one, two, and one long operator. Um, and these are able, you see here, there is a sum over all these entries of this vector. Uh, I will not go into the details because the time is over, uh, but the upshot is that these correlators are able to probe all of the directions uh, in this anomalous dimension matrix. So we can compute all of them. Um, here is just some numbers of like how many we computed. And these are enough to guess this, uh, com this contribution to gamma two squared. So we can actually compute it. And from that, we bootstrap the uh, 1111 correlator at three loops. Sorry if it was a bit fast, uh, but I also wanted to show you some of our results. Um, so here are the reduced correlators for 1111. Uh, this function of a single variable. And you see here we have the free theory, um, three level, then one loop. Uh, you see they have precisely the structure that I showed you in, in the beginning, I wasn't lying. And then here we have um, the two loops result. And I am not showing the three loops because it, it would take more than one slide, but the structure is exactly the same. Um, instead for correlators of half PPS operators, uh, we can compute them up to two loops in closed form. Uh, the free theory, well, here there is a hypergeometric function, but this is just the result of the contraction, so there is nothing special. Um, it is nice to observe that all correlators between uh, PP, QQ uh, operators are proportional to the 1111 correlator. And that's why the anomalous dimensions are proportional to the Casimir uh, at three level. Uh, whereas at, at one loop, uh, we still have proportionality with 1111. But you, we also have something like contributions from six point functions and so on. Uh, and then the other important result that we obtain uh, is these uh, anomalous dimensions and uh, OP coefficient of phi squared up to order one over lambda squared. And finally, uh, well, I should thank you. No, there is an outlook first, but I also wanted to show you um, since there was a question uh, after Andrea's talk on Tuesday, um, a plot of uh, the correlator that we computed. We have some good control uh, analytically. So I can show you um, sorry, some results. Okay, so here this epsilon is uh, proportional to one over lambda. So when epsilon is zero, we are at strong coupling and I am plotting the ratio between the correlator and the free theory correlator at lambda equals infinity. And if I go to smaller values of lambda, you see that uh, everything uh, well, changes just by a little bit, quite smoothly. And here I am reaching um, a value of G equals one. And I will show you from a plot that our results actually interpolate well uh, until G equals one. Uh, whereas here, we also have a result at weak coupling. We start from G equals zero. And again, we can increase G up to about 0 0.2. And you see that the shape is more or less the same. They, they have different values, but they, this, the shape is really similar. And going back to the talk, I am divided by the free theory correlator. And for the reduced correlator, you have exactly the same thing. One, the, the correlator is specified by a function and a number. And at lambda equals infinity and lambda equals zero, the function is the same and the number changes. So I'm actually dividing by the same object. Um, so just one minute and uh, the talk will be over. Sorry for this. Um, before the outlook, I wanted to show you uh, this plot again, stealing from Andrea. 
Uh, this is uh, the OP coefficient that uh, they computed numerically and we computed analytically. And you can see here that up to G equals uh, approximately one, we have good agreement and uh, at weak coupling for G up to 0 0.2. So uh, the plots that I showed you actually make sense in this regime. Um, and finally, let me give a, a brief outlook um, of what can be done in the future. Um, first, we can extend these techniques and ideas to other theories such as uh, ABJM, where results are available at three level, or possibly a surface, surface defect um, in 60 and equals 2,0. But also in the same setup, uh, we can study, in principle, it would be interesting to do it with coupling, different representations for the Wilson line or one over n corrections. Another interesting uh, point is to uh, the possibility to explore higher point functions, which are not really explored in higher dimensions, uh, but they will probably be in the future. Uh, and it would be nice to use this uh, simplified 1D setup as a toy model for this. Um, then again, uh, we can develop 1D CFT techniques. And finally, uh, there is this challenge of combining uh, analytical bootstrap, integrability, and, and numerical bootstrap uh, to try and solve and learn everything about this 1D CFT. Thank you for the attention. Questions? I think there is a question from very far away. Uh, just from behind here first. Um, very nice, I mean, so you can claim to have done the bootstrap. Uh, Analytically, completely, yes, everybody would have, would have dreamt off long ago. Uh, but let me ask, um, how safe is that assumption that you get away with the harmonic polylogs? Sorry, can you repeat? How safe is the expansion that you get away with the harmonic polylogs? So um, at three level, uh, it is just a structure of the functions. Uh, the correlators are just given by a sum of the functions, so we're completely safe that the structure will be that. Uh, and then for the rest, it's, uh, it's a guess. But we have uh, as a confirmation that this worked. Um, so Andrea uh, and collaborator came after us, but before uh, there was this uh, already some numerical results that we, we could compare to uh, from Grabner, Gromov, and Julius. So we obtained this expansion for the anomalous dimension, and uh, our ansatz and our collators seem to, to work very well. And also, uh, you have a lot of constraints uh, in, in this uh, bootstrap problem, and the fact that you can actually solve them analytically. Uh, and actually with simple results is, uh, I think, a non-trivial confirmation that everything seems to work. Yeah, no, I accept that, but I mean, it, it does remain a, a conjecture to some extent, right? I mean. yeah, well, it, it is not a proof, of course, uh, but as I said, there is this uh, very, very good agreement for this anomalous dimension that was known numerically, we found the analytical result and the agreement was perfect. So we're pretty confident that the idea is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> How crucial uh, is the information coming from the topological subsector in your results? Is it important or? Uh... So um, if you focus on 1111 only, so the simplest uh, correlator, uh, what I, I think happens is that you can find it exactly. So you would find the same uh, function of chi just up to an overall constant that you wouldn't be able to fix. So if you want to match with these integrability results, you also have to fix that constant. If you instead move to um, uh, correlators with uh, HPPS operators of higher weight, uh, then you have more constants and those are fixed by uh, all the short operators that enter in the protected OP. But it's always a finite uh, number of, uh, of parameters that you don't know. And uh, another question. Um... At a certain point, uh, you, you cited a paper by Joao and other people about the, I guess it's something about the, the growing of the anomalous dimension. Yes. Uh, is there a, a, an intuitive way to understand this bound? Um, or... So there is a relation between, um, let me try and see where it is. Okay, yeah. um, at, at three level, um, 
as I said from, from this paper, it is well known uh, that if you have contact interactions with K derivatives, there is this growth uh, of the anomalous dimensions. And we know the number of derivatives at three levels. So uh, we know what we expect and it actually works. Um, so I think that is under very good control. What is less under control uh, is what happens at higher orders. So when you include loops, the story is less clear. And what we found, uh, so th the simplest prescription that you can think of is require always the mildest growth for these anomalous dimensions. Um, that would mean you're not including all possible renormalization terms with too many derivatives. You just keep the minimal thing, only what you need. Uh, and again, uh, I don't have a proof of this, uh, but it gives the right result apparently. So it seems to be correct, but we definitely need to understand this better. Okay, Thank thanks, Pietro. Other questions? I mean, there is an obvious question you didn't mention, but I mean, what about next? Can you make this systematic order by order or, or you it, run out of steam? Or does it yes and no. Uh, uh, so if we were able to neglect mixing, uh, then the answer would be absolutely yes. We just have to find the right basis. Uh, the only complication would be finding functional relations between these polylogs. So if you take one function of this basis, you, you have to take crossing symmetry, compute it at one minus chi and relate it to the other functions. But it's just a technical point. Uh, whereas the major obstruction would be mixing. So uh, there was actually a big effort behind this computation of this gamma two squared. And in particular, something that I was hiding completely um, is that you have to compute some, um, when you consider these uh, operators, these correlators with uh, an unprotected operator, uh, to extract these values that are the numbers we're interested in, you have to know these OP coefficients exactly. So while these are very simple, uh, these here, which are from D2, the external operator, and one of the states in the mixing sector, um, you can either extract them from computing many, many, many uh, correlators in the free theory or from big contractions, but you have to build the operators explicitly. This was quite heavy. Uh, now, probably the, like, the methods that we used, uh, the codes that we used can be improved, uh, but surely uh, this is uh, an important obstacle. And also you would need to solve mixing not only for, to go to higher orders, not only for this gamma two, uh, but for gamma three, for the OPE coefficients, so when you move uh, to the following orders, I think uh, it's actually not so straightforward, but in principle, the algorithm is there and, and it should work. How long will it, will it take you? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm you... really sorry. We thought this would take two months. It took two years. Okay. So <laughs> no, not, not two years, but it, it took longer than expected. Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I would not commit to, to any date, sorry. <laughs> that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pietro, for the very nice talk. Uh, the, the number of correlators that you need to include would, would change if you go to higher, higher orders? Yes. Uh, okay. I think the, re the main reason for this, and this is another reason why it will be harder, is that, uh, as I showed you at some point, at one loop, we only need to consider um, the entries of this anomalous dimension matrix that, that connect length two with length two and length two with length four. But if you go to next order, you also need to include length six. And again, you need to consider these operators explicitly, construct them, compute OP coefficients. So yes, I think it will be significantly harder. <laughs> 